Hey Life Science, we're going to continue with botany today. This time we're studying seeds and fruits because they are the products of plant reproduction. You can't spell reproduction without product, so let's take a look at those. So at first glance, um, that slide might look a little terrifying. There's a whole bunch of information in it. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, what you need to know is going to be down here. So. Um, if you're ever like, oh, I can't remember all this, this is all the stuff that you need to remember. This stuff up here is here for two reasons. Um, one, because it would have been um, more work for me to take this out. So, you know, there's that. And two, because, I mean, it is really cool. And some of you may be interested in it. I'd rather leave it there um, for those who want to see it, who who care, and uh, just let the rest of you just, just ignore it and check out the notes that I'm giving you. Anyway, let's uh, get started. So the um, first thing that we need to remember is that the, uh, the actual event of plant reproduction involves pollen and an ovule combining together to form a new genetically unique organism. When that first happens, that first cell that results from the fusion of a fertilized egg, we call that a zygote. Now, that zygote is unique in the sense that it's not either of its parents, but it's not um, really ready to start its life as a plant yet. For example, um, in order to live as a plant, you need to be able to photosynthesize, you need to have roots, you need to have all that kind of stuff. So in order to keep this zygote um, viable, in order to keep it alive before it's able to become planted, uh, the plant needs to give it a food source, like, you know, an energy um, source and some nutrition so that it's able to um, survive long enough to be planted and then once planted, have enough energy to grow to the point where it can produce its own leaves. That's what an endosperm is. The endosperm is more of the product of uh, the reproductive cycle. It's not um, the zygote. It's, uh, it's kind of like a, a side job that the uh, reproductive organs do. And this gets absorbed into the cotyledons. So cotyledons absorb the remaining endosperm, and then it provides nutrition to the embryo. They also produce enzymes that help the embryo to absorb more nutrients from the endosperm. So when you eat a seed, here pictured um, is a pea and a kernel of corn. When you eat those, the part that you are getting your nutrition from are the cotyledons. And the reason that they are so packed with energy and nutrition is because that was um, packaged in there, stored for the uh, baby plant, um, the plant embryo that um, is inside that seed. So when you're eating vegetables, um, you're eating the lunch that the plant's mommy packed for its baby, you monster. Moving on. Um, more about cotyledons. You know that monocots produce only one, digots produce two. And when the cotyledons are fully formed, the embryo is mature. Okay, so speaking of a mature embryo, um, it has a food reserve for growth in the form of an endospore or a cotyledon. Um, and then it needs to be severed from the plant's ovule and develop a protecting coat, a protective coating called a testa. So we've got a, uh, a brand new baby embryo plant, right, inside of a flower that has become fertilized. When it's uh, building up its energy storage, then at some point it needs to be able to disconnect itself from the plant that produced it so it can go off and be planted and sprout somewhere else. So when it separates from the flower that produced it, it develops this hard coating called a testa. And once this testa is formed, we can now call that a seed. A seed is just an embryo some food source, like an endospor uh, endosperm or a cotyledon or two, and a hard coating that protects it and contains it. There's your seed. So um, even though it's disconnected from the plant, it's still going to be inside the ovary. And how it gets from inside the ovary out into the world actually is kind of an interesting story, and it helps us to distinguish many different kinds of plants 
by how they do that because that is what a fruit is. An ovary that still contains seeds is going to somehow develop or mature to become a seed delivery system. Okay, the ovary contains egg cells uh, or ovules. The pollen comes down into the um, ovary to fertilize those ovules. It becomes a zygote. It packs a big lunch for it, stores energy and food and um, nutrition, puts it in a hard casing, and now the ovary's job is no longer to hold eggs, but to hold seeds and deliver them to propagate the species so that the plant may live for another generation. And whatever that ovary becomes to um, distribute those seeds is a fruit. And that takes us to the grocery store. Now, um, there are different ways of defining certain words. Sometimes there's a popular definition as opposed to a scientific definition. Um, one word that gets misunderstood a lot is the word theory. People use the word theory to mean a guess, but a scientific theory is very, very far from a guess. It has to be based on all the available and relevant evidence. It needs to be able to um, be an explanatory model for something that it describes. It needs to be able to predict future discoveries. I mean, it's way more than just a guess, but that's the difference between a popular definition and a scientific definition. Right now, I'm talking about the scientific definition of fruit. A fruit would be a swollen, mature, or somehow transformed ovary containing seeds. It doesn't sound very appetizing. Um, so that's one of the reasons why that's not the definition of fruit used in the grocery store, because uh, the grocery store is where you go to get stuff that should be appetizing, right? So um, there will be some things in here that are classified as fruit that you did not think were fruit. And in fact, if you called them fruit, everyone else is perfectly justified in saying, uh, no, it's not, be quiet, please. So um, please don't use this information to become nerdy and rude. Um, it didn't work for me and it won't work for you. Let's move on. So um, the first category of fruit that we're going to talk about is called simple fruit because it is a single ovary. So um, the first category of simple fruit would be fleshy fruit. These are the fruit that everyone knows is fruit because it's fleshy tissue that forms between the seeds and the ovary covering. These would also be very juicy fruit. Uh, yeah, juicy fruit. So um, these would be pretty familiar to you in the category of fruit. Let's take a look. So um, one example of a fleshy fruit. Remember, this is a simple fruit, so it's a single ovary. And under that category, it's fleshy fruit. So um, one category of those is pomes. Now, um, you can see there a picture of an apple. And if you take uh, French, then you know that the word for apple in French is almost exactly that. You just add an extra M, turn pome into palm. Anyway, um, in a poem, the fleshy part of the fruit is actually not formed from the ovary, but it um, comes from the tip of the pedicel instead. So in the case of an apple or a pear, the core of that fruit is actually the ovary. It's usually not very appetizing because it's kind of hard and leathery. I mean, you know apple cores, they're not nice to eat at all. Um, they also are what contain the seeds. Um, next time you're eating an apple, if you want to cut it open with a knife, you can actually see it's it's kind of faint, but there's like a line that separates the core from not the core, okay? So the part of the fruit that you're eating, maybe I should say the part of the flower that you're eating with an apple is actually the pedicel. Um, the ovary is the core, and that's also true of pears. Okay, so simple fruit, fleshy fruit, pomes. Let's see another kind of fleshy fruit. They're called droops. That is one of my favorite words to say. I, I just think it's so fun. Droop. Yeah. Okay, so um, in a droop, the ovary forms a hard covering around the seed and then encloses that covering in fleshy tissue. So in this particular case, the seed that's encased in the covering is called the pit and the fleshy tissue is the fruit, right? So um, the ovary is um, going to put an extra hard covering on that seed. That's why like um, 
the seed of a of a peach is just so impossible and huge extra hard covering on there and then um it's surrounded by uh fleshy uh fruit around that peaches are of course a good example of that as are plums okay so we got poems we got droops we also have berries berries are another kind of fleshy fruit and uh, here we have our first, oh, I didn't know that because, uh, well, actually, maybe you did. Um, this is one of the first um, smart alecky science things that people learn is that tomatoes are actually fruit. Boy, do we have some more surprises for you. But let's just stick on tomatoes for a second. Turns out tomatoes are actually berries because a berry is an ovary that doesn't form a hard covering around the seeds, but instead it just encloses the seed or seeds in fleshy tissue. So you know how like in a tomato, the seeds are really small and soft. Um, you can just eat them, it's not a problem. Well, it's because they're not protected in a hard covering like they were for droops. Um, they're just suspended in this fleshy tissue. So grapes and tomatoes are both examples of berries. And funny, neither of them have berry in their name. Hmm. All right, moving on. Uh, there is something which is similar, um, but it's different enough to warrant its own category. Call it like modified berries or like berries with an asterisk, right? Um, so a modified berry has a thicker, tougher covering, call it like a rind maybe, um, around the fleshy tissue, um, whereas the berries just have like that really thin covering, you know, like the skin of a grape or of a tomato is very, very thin, uh, but the skin of something like a cucumber or an orange is a lot more substantial. So there's cucumber, our second fruit, which is typically in the vegetable category. Just think for a second, why do we call something like a tomato or a cucumber a vegetable when in fact they're technically fruit? Well, remember that these are nutritional categories, not, uh, not biological categories. We categorize things not by what they are, but what they are to us, right? So it's uh, one of the reasons why um, we might say, think, sure, it's probably fine to eat cows and pigs, but like eat a dog, no way. Look, scientifically speaking, they're all just animals. The reason that we treat them differently is because of what they are to us. For us, cows and pigs are not pets, but dogs are, so we treat them differently. It's not about them, it's about us, right? Um, yeah, and some of you are thinking, what are you talking about? I don't eat any of those. Right, it's, it's about us, it's not about them. Anyway, um, when it comes to fruit versus vegetables, the kind of flavors as well as the kind of nutrition that we get from different kinds of plant products, we would group them together as vegetables, uh, maybe because they're not as sweet right? Maybe because um, they tend to um, mature in a certain time of year uh, versus others. It all just has to do with, um, you know, is does it go in a salad or does it go on top of a cake? You know, it, it's, it, it's not a scientific category. It's just a grocery store category. So don't get hung up on that. But by all means, let your mind be blown that um, cucumbers are fruit. Let's move on. We've got um, more simple fruit, which is a single ovary, but this time we're done with fleshy fruit. We're gonna do dry fruit. Dry fruit is some fruit that has no fleshy tissue that forms between the seeds and the ovary covering. So a good example of that would be a pod. A pod would be a single chamber that contains many seeds. A good example would be beans and peanuts. And um, maybe you never categorized them together at the same time, but here we go. It turns out that they belong to the same group of um, fruit, in fact. Neither one of those we would have considered fruit, but that's what they are. It is a matured plant ovary containing seeds. They're fruit. Um, I chose that picture of beans because you can actually see the seeds through the pod. And in fact, um, we typically would eat some beans in their pod, but other kinds of beans we take out of their pod peas grow in a pod. We just don't eat the pods unless they're like sugar snap peas. Then we do. Eh, you know, it's not, it's not science. It's, it's, it's kitchen, right? Anyway, back to the science. 
next category of dry fruit is a capsule. So a capsule is um, a, again, mature transformed ovary that contains many chambers containing many seeds. A good example of those would be poppy seeds. Now, you probably see poppy seeds um, in a container or maybe just like on a bagel. Um, they do come from flowers. They come from a poppy flower. And when the flower is matured and it's developed its seeds, it looks like that in that picture. Um, those just contain a whole bunch of poppy seeds. And even though I would, I, I would not want to eat that at all, um, that's technically a fruit because it's a transformed ovary containing mature seeds. I mean, you know. Yep, all right, so uh, next up, you didn't think this was fruit, did you? This is called a Samara. These are um, when a long, thin wing forms from the ovary wall, and a good example of that would be maple seeds, right? So you're all familiar with those. You've seen maple seeds before. I mean, you know, it's technically fruit, but um, again, I don't want to eat one, um, especially this next one. I might want to eat a walnut, but I don't want to eat an acorn. Um, these are nuts. That is a category of dry fruit in which the ovary forms a hard, woody covering around a single seed. Now, remember, peanuts, not in this category. Peanuts aren't even nuts. They grow in a pod. That plant doesn't form a woody covering around a single seed. You know, that's, uh, yeah, I know, I know. All right, so uh, next up, yet another thing that we put in a different part of the food pyramid. Uh, this is a grain. A grain is a fruit that is categorized as having an ovary wall connected to the seed. A good example is corn. So um, if you cook corn, of course, then it's very easy to take it apart because you've partially destroyed it. But if you take a raw kernel of corn and open it up, you'd find that the ovary wall is connected to the seed and you would have to damage it in order to remove it. You know, it's um, it's a bit like trying to take uh, tape off of a wall that pulls paint off there. They are connected. You can't just remove it like you can um, take something out of a case. It's it's connected to it. It's part of it. Okay, um, another kind of dry fruit is called an akine. And this is unlike a grain because the ovary wall is separated from the seed. So a good example of that would be a sunflower seed. If you've ever eaten sunflower seeds, you know it's like a seed inside of a seed. Well, it's a seed inside of a seed case. Well, actually that seed case is the ovary wall. And so the ovary wall is separated from the seed inside. If they were joined together, we would call it grain. But because they're separated, it's an akine. Okay, so we've talked about um, simple fruit this whole time. That would be a single ovary. We had fleshy fruit. We had dry fruit. Under fleshy fruit, we had pomes, we had berries, we had modified berries. Under uh, dry fruit, we had pods, we had nuts, um, we had akines and samaras. Whew. Lots and lots of categories. We're moving on to compound fruit. These would be fruit that contain multiple ovaries. And one um, kind of compound fruit is called an aggregate fruit. And that's several ovaries from the same flower. And good examples are raspberries and strawberries. If you remember way back, way back a couple minutes ago when I was talking about berries, we had grapes and tomatoes and neither one had berry in their name. Finally, we have fruit with berry in their name and they're not even berries. Yeah, okay, so um, these aggregate fruits are made of several ovaries from the same flower. That's why they've got um, that structure that they do, like little pockets of seeds distributed around it. Um, Besides aggregate fruit, we also have multiple fruit. Instead of multiple ovaries from a single flower, this is a collection of ovaries from several different flowers. And good examples of these would be pineapples, figs, and mulberries. Now, we're very familiar with pineapples, and you know they have that pattern on them, um, kind of almost looks like a turtle shell. Each one of those little cells in that pattern comes from another flower. So when it all fuses together into one fruit, that is called a multiple fruit. Okay, why? Why do plants go through all the trouble to make all these fruit? Well, it's 
kind of similar to why it goes through all the trouble to make the flowers. It has to do with its place in the ecosystem and the symbiotic relationships it has with other creatures and how they all interact. You know, plants don't have eyes, they don't have noses, they can't see the pretty flowers or the bright fruit, they can't smell the, the flowers, right? Um, a lot of this is so that it can interact with some animals. And one of the things that a plant um, benefits from is having its seeds transported far away from itself. If too many of the same kind of plant are growing in one place, like if, if a plant just dropped its seeds on the ground, then they're all going to grow up together and they're going to have to compete for resources. But if they spread out, more resources to go around. Maybe they can compete with some other species, maybe drive them extinct so they can have all the resources for themselves <laughs> or something like that. Um, yeah, right. Plants don't have eyes, ears or noses, but they can be like evil somehow. Yeah, that makes sense for Mr. Estes. All right. Well, anyway, let's move on. So um, how do the plants get their seeds far away? One way that they can do it is by carrying them away on the wind. You know that like dandelion seeds and thistle seeds are great at that. Um, a samara will float on the wind. Surely you've seen on like a really windy day in the fall, a whole bunch of uh, maple seeds um, all, you know, floating down like helicopters. That's a lot of fun. Um, when it comes to like um, nuts and pods, those are fairly sturdy seed coverings. They can be carried away and buried by animals as food reserves. Great example of that, thus the pictures, is a squirrel who will bury acorns in little stashes. And um, if, say, a squirrel forgets about one of them or is eaten by something else before it has a chance to dig it up, then that acorn has been basically planted by that squirrel. So, you know, thanks a lot, Mr. Squirrel, said the oak tree. It just planted a seed for it. Okay, so um, uh, last thing um, has to do um, usually with freshy, uh, freshy fleshy fruit because they are um, so attractive as food for a lot of animals, including, you know, bats, monkeys, humans, right? So um, these compound and fleshy fruits, when they're eaten by animals, distribute the seeds either by discarding them, you know, like um, you eat an apple, but you leave the core, or maybe um, you're eating something when the seeds are too big, like a, a peach pit, so you just leave it. Okay, so that's one way that a seed may be distributed. An animal takes a fruit, walks away with it, eats it, and leaves a seed. Or it could be, here's the fun one, that um, the protective coating on the seeds allows a seed to survive digestion. So you eat a seed, and the seed's covering allows it to pass through your stomach undissolved, and then it goes through your intestines and eventually... An animal poops it out and basically plants it in a mound of fertilizer. It's a pretty sweet deal for a seed. And assuming that it took a few hours through the animal's body, it could have been transported very far away during that time. Well, um, it was very nice to end talking about poop. That's exactly the thought I want to leave you with. Uh, no, just kidding. Really, what I want to leave you with is that what we think of as fruit is not exactly what a scientist would think of when they think of fruit. Um, there is what it is to the organism, and then there is what it is to us. We have categories for creatures like pet and livestock and pest. Those are how they interact with us. But then we have categories of organisms like mammal and reptile and bird and those are more about them than they are about us we have similar categories for plants what's a weed it's a plant that you don't want there it has nothing to do with the plant itself it has everything to do with you and so the category of fruit that i've been discussing in this presentation is a scientific description of what the plant is and what it is doing it is a matured ovary containing mature seeds. But the popular definition of fruit has more to do with what it tastes like, what it's good with, when it's ripe, and what kind of nutrition you get from it, or how much sugar is in it, or how brightly colored it is. Okay, so 
I hereby do not give you permission to be a jerk about what is and is not a fruit. Please don't do that. Nobody likes it. And if you say, but I learned it in life science, and they're going to come to me with that. And, um, okay, just, just, just don't. Anyway, um, that's going to be all for this section. And um, I hope that you found it at least interesting, if not, um, you know, educational. See ya.